to start addressing some of the points, both in Bob's opening statement and in Bob's first cross, um, <coughs> Bob's first rebuttal. So, uh, Bob started out by drawing a line between microevolution and macroevolution. This is a line that I have heard been drawn in the sand since I was 13 or 14, and I first came across some books explaining evolutionary theory to me. And I would like to say that the diff the thing about macroevolution and microevolution is that it's a false dichotomy. There is absolutely no reason to draw a line between micro and macro. And the problem is that when you try and divide these two types of evolution, what you'll find is there, that there is no clear line. There is no place in the sand where you can draw a line and say, this is microevolution, this is macroevolution. Microevolution, given thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions of years is macroevolution. The same mechanisms which drive the acquiring of new traits, the modification of species shapes over time in response to environmental pressure, writ large, are macroevolutionary pressures. There's one anecdote that I've heard in one of my evolutionary biology courses that I think really demonstrates um, very, very well how fuzzy this line actually is. Um, and that anecdote goes like this. From 1900 to the year 2000, humans have increased in height by 1%. Now you can say that this is um, nutrition plus technology plus whatever, but a 1% increase in height over 100 years. You absolutely would say that's microevolution. That's the same kind of scale that we see changes in finches' beaks, the same kind of scale that we see in generation of these species of fruit flies when you put them under different pressures, same kind of scale as being able to measure a species getting larger or smaller based on environment, based on how much food there is in that environment. One percent increase in height over a hundred years for humans. Now, at that rate of change, how long would it take for the average human to be 12 feet tall? if humans increase 1% in height every century? About 7,000 years. Now, 7,000 put next to 6 million, which is the last common, the most recent common ancestor of humans and chimps, put next to something like 20 or 30, I can't remember the top of my head, million, the last common ancestor of the primates against the rest of the mammals. It's absolutely absurd to say that this is absolutely microevolution and that's absolutely macroevolution. The next point uh, that Bob raised was irreducible complexity. And he brought up the example of a mousetrap. It's true, if you have a mousetrap, it has a base, a spring, a hammer, and a catch. And if you took away any of those parts, it no longer functions like a mousetrap. If you look at a bacterial flagellum, it has a whole lot of parts working together to drive a motor, to drive a flagellum, to spin, to propel the bacterium. And if you're missing any of these parts, the, mouse, the flagellum doesn't function. But if you take a mousetrap and remove the base, it still makes a perfectly serviceable tie clip. If you remove the catch, it still makes a perfectly serviceable spring. And what we see in biology is that every single example which intelligent design proponents have brought up and attempted to posit is irreducibly complex are actually made of parts which themselves have function in any of a number, any number of different other uh, purposes. Um, a what happens in biology very very frequently is a duplication of a gene in the DNA. There's many ways that gene duplication happens. In fact, the protein that carries blood um, to all of your vital organs, hemoglobin, has something like 30 variants. 30 Has something like 30 variants, all caused by duplication of the same sequence again and again and again and again. And what we find is that duplication plus recombination allows juggling of pre-existing parts in an infinite number of, com of combinations. And the combinations which grant an advantage are the ones that get selected and the ones that get fixed. 
we can look at the descent of the hemoglobin proteins in humans. We can compare the descent of hemoglobin in humans to other organisms. 